in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. You know, lately over the last few weeks, I've really been thinking about just how bad it was. You know, the devil has this way when you're out there and you're in sin of smoothing it over. He has this way of excusing it away. You know, where he makes your, your lying not seem so bad to you. Where he makes your cussing and your, your fornication and, and all of that nonsense that we engage in when we're out in the world. He has this way of kind of helping you to reconcile it where you think you're not that bad. And then, you know, when you get saved and you change, then those things get old and they pass away. Amen. And so you, you find yourselves where sometimes that, that, you know, whether you're saved or whether you're not, that, that stuff kind of gets, gets kind of passed away. But I was thinking this week on just how bad it really was. And the Lord was kind of bringing me back through some things I had done and some things I had gone through. And he was showing me in spiritual eyes just how foolish it was, how wicked it was, how much of a nonsense it was, how vain it was, how, how it added absolutely no value to my life. And he was making it so very clear to me. And so as I was looking at this set of scripture today, I begin to think upon David and the testimony that he gives here. Because David had an awesome testimony, how he had started off as nothing, nothing in his eyes, nothing in his father's eyes, to the point where his dad didn't even acknowledge him when Samuel came a-calling, to placing him to be the king over all of Israel, that all the nations around them would bow down unto them. This was his testimony. And to watch him grow from just a little lad to the king of Israel to the point where even when Shimei came against him, he said, well, let him alone. He said, because this might be the will of the Lord. He says, even though I got to take dishonor and I'm the king, I got to position myself where the Lord's will must be done in this matter. And so there was a growth that was taking place in him. And this is a testimony that he gave. And so I'm here today to ask you, what is your testimony? What is your testimony? In case the brothers are wanting back there, that is indeed the title of the message. What is your testimony? Testimony is simply a public telling or describing of a religious conversion or experience. But in addition to that, if you continue reading on the definition, it will say something like an evidence or a proof provided by the existence or appearing of something. And so it's very important that we understand that testimony is not just about what you open your mouth and say. It's also, and even more importantly, about what you do. That if what you say does not align with what you do, then there is not an accurate witness or testimony there. Come on, preacher. Many times we get confused when it's time to give a testimony. And we open our mouths and we want to give a testimony. But if somebody's standing there that understands that what you do doesn't align with what you are saying, then that, you don't have very much weight in your testimony. And so I'm here to ask you today, what is your testimony? Number one, are you opening your mouth and telling about the goodness of God? And then number two, does that align with what people see in your life and how you walk and how you talk, especially when you think people aren't looking? Look what David says here. He says, I waited patiently for the Lord. We know that many times that's where we struggle. Yep. He starts off his testimony saying that he was waiting patiently. Many of us, we fall off and there becomes this disconnect between our, what we say and what we do right here wow. when we're asked to wait patiently. Come on, preacher. There seems to be this disconnect where we can't seem to get that done. We can't wait in line at the Popeyes if it's more than two cars ahead of us. Ah, 
there's an issue there, and we can't wait patiently. But this word patiently means simply to expect or to wait upon. And so many times we find ourselves in situations where we're called by the Lord to wait patiently that we keep looking for a way out. You see, we want the Lord to take us out, not take us through. It's easy for us to find a way out. You see, it's easy for us when our wife says something we don't like to find a way out, that we leave the room or we leave the house. But it's hard for us to get some shut mouth grace and humble ourselves and keep quiet that the will of God might be done in us and in our wives and in our house. Because it's hard for somebody to have a fight by themselves. But see, there's a requirement that if we're going to wait patiently on the Lord, that we understand why we're waiting patiently on the Lord. We're waiting on the Lord because there's an expectation that he's going to deliver. Not that there's an expectation that he's going to let us out, but there's an expectation that he's going to deliver. Now, when we start talking about deliverance, we must understand what has to take place in order for us to be delivered. See, the, the reason that we are in situations, and sometimes the reason that we're in situations so long, or the reason we find ourselves in that same situation over and over and over is that we haven't gotten to the point that we need to. We haven't gotten the lesson. We haven't gotten rid of the junk and the mess that the Lord is trying to work out of us. We haven't learned how to handle that situation, that we might go on to the next situation, handling that situation correctly, that we might learn from the next lesson that we need to learn from. You see, there's a requirement sometimes in those situations where we must wait patiently. Simply the Lord is waiting for us to cast off some nonsense that we got on us so that he can exalt us to the next level. But sometimes we find ourselves with these crowns on that we don't want to let go. Sometimes we have on the crown of pride, and we don't want to let the crown of pride go. We got the the crown of, I feel it's got to be done the way I think it should be done. We got the crown of attitude sometimes. We got the, 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 the crown of co- covetousness and greediness and we got the crown of lust and fornication and we don't want to let those things go. And when it, it's amazing. Every time I talk to somebody that tells me about a breakthrough that they had, how the Lord moved on their behalf, they'll tell you if you listen real close to their testimony about how they had to lay down something. They had to lay down what their expectation was of how things should be. They had to lay down what they wanted to do. They had to lay down what they were holding on to. And they'll tell you all the same thing. And it'll sound differently how they tell you. But what they essentially will say is, when I got rid of this, when I put this down, when I cast this to the side, when things that had value to me and that were important to me that I was trying to cling on, I decided no longer to cling on to those things. And I just said, Lord, it's got to be your way. Then he moved. And so look what David says. He says, I waited patiently for the Lord. And when he did that, he inclined unto me and he heard my cry. That's a a beautiful word, incline there. That means to stretch forth or to bend down to. You know, many times when I talk to my children and when I talk to your children as well, I'll get down at their level. Because in teaching, in explaining, I want to make sure that we're on a level where they can understand. See, there are some things that we have to do in our households, men sometimes, where it's not about lording over the household, but it's about loving over the household. You understand? And so there are times when I need to get down on a knee or get down on two knees, and I need to just take time out and explain. I need to take time out and teach. I need to take time out and provide those things that they need that they might grow and go in the way that God would have them to go. And so he said that as he waited patiently for the Lord, that the Lord bent down to him and he heard his cry. And I bend down to my children because they're precious. And so many times we get in a situation where we don't understand who we are. We don't understand just how precious we are to God. 
You see, we find ourselves so many times where we want to call Jesus a liar, uh -huh. where we want to call God a liar. Yeah. God says something, but we think something else. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, we might not say it like that. We, we won't come out and say it, you know, I, Jesus is a liar. But we'll behave like and we'll say other things on, that will give clear indication that we call him a liar. Yeah. And we'll simply call him a liar because we don't believe what he said. On, but look what, he's, look, look what it's all about. Look what he says. He says, he inclined to me and he heard my cry. And so many times we get in a situation where we don't even think God heard us. And if we think if God heard us, that God won't move on our behalf. That's where we find ourselves, that he won't do what he said he would do. And, and make no mistake about it, that is simply a lack of faith. On, we find those situations, and we call it being humble. Well, I know God is able to do this, but I'm not sure if he'll do this for me. Sure. Well, what you just said when you said you're not sure was you don't have an expectation that he's going to do it for you. If you don't have an expectation that he's going to move on your behalf, then you're not patiently waiting. Come on, preacher. It's quiet today. <laughs> That's simply a faith issue. And look, sometimes we understand that we don't, we don't think God is hearing us because we're not right. And that's okay, too. But see, but that's your opportunity to cast down those crowns that you're holding on to well, that you can get right. Well said, see, so many times we're in these storms and we're struggling and we're struggling and we're struggling. And the only thing we're looking for is a way out. Mm. And we'll run to whatever will get us out. We'll run to a lie. Right. We'll run into the arms of somebody else. Uh. We'll run to the Internet to get an opinion that we agree from on our friends on Facebook. But we, we're looking for a way out as opposed to looking for a way to grow in God. But look what he says as he goes on. He says, I waited patiently. He says, the Lord heard me. And then he says, and he brought me up also out of a horrible pit. That horrible pit is simply destruction. We have to understand that we were destined for hell. We were on the path. We was on the road. We had cruise control on. Right. But God. But God. Yeah. But God. But God. You see, and we, we miss that piece so, so often. So many times that's the piece we miss is that we were destined for hell. That's, that's a shouting moment right there. On, we were destined for hell. We was going to bust hell wide open. See, we, had, we were chained with lies that we thought we was all right. We had this, this semblance of holiness that the world has that allows them to tell their kids that Santa Claus is real, but still go to church on Sunday and say that they're holy. But see, that's a semblance of holiness, but there's no holiness in there. The Bible says that all liars have a place in the pit of fire, in the lake of fire. That means they're going to burn with a fervent heat. All liars. So you can say you're a Christian all you want to. If you lie to your kids telling you he know when you're sleeping, he know when you're awake, he know when you've been bad or good, so be good for goodness sake, they lying. Why is it that we think it's okay for our children to fear Santa Claus but not fear God? See, there's a problem there. See, each and every one of us in here was destined to hell. If any of you was born and you were saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost when you got here, let me know. I'd love to talk to you about that. But that's where we were heading. But then God came along and he heard our cry. And if we be some honest, some of us wasn't even smart enough to cry. He just had grace and mercy on you and pulled you out your mess anyway. While you was trying your very hardest to do more mess and more junk, while you were trying to find a club that was open on Tuesday night so you could get to that club, God had mercy on you and save you. You had your Saturday night, your Sunday night club. You had your Monday night club. Wednesday, Thursday. You needed one on Tuesday. You were trying to do more dirt than you was doing, and God had mercy on you. And he pulled them out of the miry clay. That miry clay was very interesting when I took a look at that. That miry part means the most worthless part. 
That clay means that, that stuff that stuck to you. You see, we got to understand when we're out in that world, the most worthless stuff stuck to us. The stuff that had no value stuck to us. We was walking around with stuff with, with tea bags that was used, with coffee grounds, and we thought we was good. But it was the most worthless stuff. And some of us, we still walking around with some of that worthless stuff. We refuse to let it go. It don't matter how much God deals with you. It don't matter how many issues you go through. It doesn't matter how many problems that you have. You still want to hold on to that most worthless stuff. And so you keep going right on around that hill. You say, didn't we see this rock last year? Didn't we see that rock last month? You keep seeing that same old rock. You start writing on that rock. God was here on this day. You come back around. God was here again on this day right here. And we wonder why we are doing that. We wonder why we're going through these things. And it's simply because we won't let go of the most worthless things. Make no mistake about it. If it's keeping you from serving God in the way he wants you to serve God, it's a worthless thing. And I'm here to tell you, I really don't care what it is. See, see, this is where people want to put the asterisk. And they want to say, well, you know, but, you know, that, that requires me to do this. Or that requires me to do this. Look, if you got a job. And you go to that job, and you just can't help but to cuss and act a fool at that job, you need to leave that job. If anything hinders you from serving Jesus, you need to get rid of that. Now, I'm not telling you, to, now, there'll be some brother, I'm called in because I need to serve Jesus. You can serve Jesus on your job. But the word of God says, look, he says, if your eye offend you, he said, pluck it out. He said, get rid of that thing. Now, if he's telling you that, you know what, you think, you know, your eye, you think that's pretty valuable to you. He said, but if that's going to get between me and me, get rid of it. That's right. Let that thing go. That's right. There's an expectation that we get rid of that junk that holds us so that we can wait patiently on the Lord so that we would have a testimony. See, we got to understand we need to start having a testimony in our testimony. Come on, See, the reason we can't get no testimony at the end is because we can't get a testimony in the beginning. Come on, uh, preacher. We can't tell, we, we, we have no expectation, we have no foundation of what God is already doing in our lives. So therefore, we have no expectation that he's going to take us out what we're in. So there's no testimony now, there's no testimony then. There was some men, they had a testimony in a testimony. Their name was Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Let's look at Daniel right quick, Daniel chapter 3. Let's look at Daniel chapter 3. We'll begin at... Um, 16. Testimony in a testimony. Look what it says here, Daniel 3 and 16. Word of God says, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace. See, that's a testimony of who.